Uh, Julia Yaffe is a writer for The Atlantic and has been covering Russia for quite some time, and she joins us now from Washington. All right, Julia, so before we get to today's meeting, can you give us some background on Sergei Lavrov? How close is he to Vladimir Putin? What are his connections to the Kremlin? Just give us some color on him. So Sergei Lavrov is a polished, experienced diplomat. He came out of the Soviet School of Diplomats, MGIMO, which is the uh, the university that trains both uh, Soviet, now Russian diplomats and spies. Uh, he, so it's a very kind of elite uh, school that he came out of. He served uh, in the UN mission in New York, so he has flawless English. He's a master, master diplomat and master, more importantly, bureaucrat. So he knows how to slow things down, how to slow roll initiatives that Russia doesn't want to see go forward. He knows how to bleed uh, of life any initiative. So you saw when he met with uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson in Moscow, he kept saying, Let's slow this down. Let's calm down. Let's talk about an investigation. Let's have an investigation. He was talking, of course, about the chemical weapons attack in Syria that happened in early April. That, of course, is done with an eye to slowing it down, dragging it out for years when people don't really remember or care anymore, and to get an outcome that's more positive for Russia. In uh, terms of how close he is to Putin, he's, of course, close to Putin, but he's a face faithful uh, executor of the policy. He doesn't really create the policy. Mm -hmm. And we saw uh, him sort of dismiss the question about whether or not uh, Director Comey's termination would have an impact on the talks. Do you know if the Russians had an opinion about Comey, whether or not indeed they would be pleased to hear the news of his termination? You know, I, th I think for the Russians, this is just more sign of chaos in uh, in a democracy. So if I if I'm Vladimir Putin or any other autocrat for that watching this, I would think, see, I told you, democracy is just not a very efficient way of doing things. Mm. Uh, that said, the Russia I was just in Russia um, until about a week ago, and the Russians think that we have lost our minds <laughs> with this whole Russia investigation. They don't see, they see neither the smoke nor the fire. They see it as an inter entirely internal political exercise. And so to them, this is something they don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. They think Americans should kind of figure this out on their own. They don't understand it. It's, um, they think it's just a witch hunt and uh, an effort to vilify Russia. So what you saw there from Lavrov is some, you know, dismissive Russian humor, very classic, sarcastic Russian humor, um, but also indicating that, that he wants nothing to do with this. So, Julia, I mean, it's interesting because there are reports that the Russians also tried to hack the French elections, and in fact, that this is something that they are looking to do across many Western democracies. Uh, do folks in Russia really believe that there isn't any kind of a plan in place to try to influence the outcome of elections that could be favorable to Russia? Well, it depends who you talk to, right? It's it's the same same thing as in the U.S. Depends who you talk to, and what are they? Ta you know, what do we talk about when we talk about Vladimir Putin and his uh, attempts to influence Western elections? He's been doing this for a long time. It started with the so-called near abroad, which is the former Soviet republics, the Baltics, Georgia, Ukraine. Uh, meddling in their elections in terms of hacking uh, and cyber warfare, false information, uh, false flag informational operations. And, and it's kind of been spreading further and further and further west and finally in 2016 and got to the U.S. But it's been happening all over Europe, both east and west, for about a decade. That said, when you talk, if you get a, a Russian who's close to the Kremlin to finally be kind of frank with you, they say, look, what about the National Endowment for Democracy? What about the International Republican Institute? What about USAID? What about all this democracy promotion mm. that the State Department has been doing? You're promoting your interests. We're promoting our interests. We don't really see any difference. This is, this is the same thing. And so you can't get up there on your high horse and tell us that you don't do the same thing. It's hypocritical. All right, so topping the agenda uh, for the meeting today with Lavrov and the president, uh, they'll be talking about Syria and Ukraine. What can we expect? Uh, you know, will there really be any sort of real resolution or an agreement hammered out at all? Probably not. Mm -hmm. The Russians like to talk for talk's sake and to talk about having more talks at which they can discuss having future talks. <laughs> like I said, this is Lavrov's specialty is to uh, stall using every bureaucratic tactic available to him because in many ways 
uh, Vladimir Putin, the Russians are truly conservative in the sense that the status quo is the best situation possible for them. And the longer they can maintain the status quo, the better. Um, so they're not going to, th there's no resolution that they want to see in Syria. Uh, when you, again, when you get people close to the Kremlin talking frankly, they say, we want a whole secular Syria, which means that. Bashar al-Assad needs to conquer back all of Syrian territory and get it under his control. What needs to happen for that? Some diplomatic breathing room and the uh, show of, you know, diplomatic movement and action when actually it's just stalling for time, giving Bashar al-Assad time to reconquer all of Syria. What's interesting is the Russians do this by talking about counterterrorism. It's their favorite thing to talk about with Western leaders because it's, you know, it's, um, it's like talking about puppies and kittens. Nobody's going to say no to talking about that. Everybody wants to fight terrorism. And the Russians can look constructive and helpful, even though they're really just stalling for time. And that's a good, that's a good point. And I, was, I follow your Twitter feed and that you did say that they might be talking about counterterrorism. I'm curious, though, if you think that President Trump might be able to influence Sergei Lavrov to push, for example, for a political transition in Syria by ousting the dictator Bashar al-Assad. I mean, you probably saw, like many people, a horrific report uh, reported on CNN yesterday that just showed the wake, in the wake of that horrific chemical attack, children gasping for breath in the back of a vehicle. These recent chemical attacks uh, on civilians have really sort of shined a spotlight. You heard the president say that he decided to take decisive action by launching that missile strike into Syria when he saw images of these, what he called the beautiful babies being killed. Um, is that something that President Trump will be able to no. deliver to Lavrov <laughs> so that he can deliver to his boss? No. Mm. Uh, like I said, of Sergey Lavrov does not make policy. He just stalls for time so that his boss can make policy and so other things can happen. He gives him kind of diplomatic cover so that he can have room to maneuver. That said, the Russians have a totally different narrative on the chemical attack. They say that it was a false flag operation by the Syrian opposition. They say the mortar containing the chemical uh, weapons warhead was, uh, had been exploded on the ground <clears throat> instead of, excuse me, instead of dropped from the air, meaning that it was the opposition that, <clears throat> excuse me again, it was the opposition that set it off in order to make the Syrian government look bad. This, of course, is not supported by any evidence, but the Russians, you can bet, will stick to this till their dying breath because, again, it makes the opposition look bad, it makes uh, Bashar al-Assad look good, and more than anything, it just muddies the water, it slows everything down. Uh, they will veto, like they did, any resolution in the UN Security Council. Again, they're trying to give Assad the time and the space to help him, and they're helping him do this militarily, to help him reconquer Syrian territory so that there can be a unified secular Syria under Bashar al-Assad. That's their goal. Julia, before we let you go, I, I, I'm curious, when you travel to Russia, we understand, obviously, that uh, press freedom in Russia is, is always under attack under Vladimir Putin's Russia. Um, have you ever sensed that on the ground? Do you ever sense that you may be followed or that uh, they're unhappy with some of your reporting that you do when you get back here? Oh, they're quite uh, they're quite open with me that they they're not happy with my reporting. Um, th the foreign ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova is quite open with me about it. I have an ongoing dialogue with her. Um, I find her to be quite open to discussions. They don't they don't make a secret out of it in terms of being followed. Maybe I'm just oblivious and I don't notice it. <laughs> I also don't I also don't really care, uh, which I think is the only way to do it because um, it takes the kind of fear and intimidation away from them. Their ability to uh, intimidate you takes it away from them. The other thing is uh, when people ask me, when Americans ask me, do you feel afraid? Uh, I find that it's, um, you know, it's not the Western journalists people should be worried about. It's the Russian journalists, mm -hmm. the, dom the, the domestic journalists on the ground who are doing the really hard work and who are the ones being intimidated, uh, charged with criminal cases, beaten, killed. They're the ones who are the front line. They're the ones who, who are getting the brunt of it. Uh, there's really not that much that they seem to want to do to Western journalists. So the, the Russian journalists are the ones doing the hard work, and that's who we should be worried about, not me. All right. Well, very good. Well, we appreciate your work, Julia Yonke you. from the uh, Atlantic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julia. Thanks.